what have you found the most in in, in terms of because i know you've also been doing doing research with lsd as well and, and a lot of people now talk about micro that's and we were talking about this before we started this seems to be another story where evidence-based has had to fight for a long time to show that the the kind of the rumors and the propaganda against lsd seem to be built yeah. on very very uh, shaky ground yeah i mean look look the reality is uh, historically the what happened the america it all started in in the 1880s with the international temperance movement the desire to get rid of all drugs but particularly alcohol and uh, of course that succeeded in america it succeeded in sweden it succeeded in, in norway in the eight, in nine, 1920s they, these these countries banned alcohol the consequences of that were horrific in in the sense that it corrupts in america every policeman was corrupted because every policeman was paid not to close down speakeasy so underground bars were opened um really low quality hooch was sold and actually by the way you may not know this but the the, the, cop, the concept of a cocktail derived from american prohibition because the alcohol was so horrible you could only drink it if you masked it with all sorts of interesting flavors so, so it was a way of allowing alcohol to be consumed in prohibition. And then, of course, you know, the mafia came along and people were getting killed. A new army of people were set up, the, you know, the untouchables, Elliot Ness and all that, and, you know, the, the, which now is, of course, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And the American people just got sick to death of, of prohibition. So it, alcohol became legal. But you still had the army. You had 35,000 soldiers and you had the general, Harry Anslinger, and he was faced with, you know, literally overnight losing his role as one of the most important people in America and all his, his army. So he had to create another scare. And he created the scare of cannabis. And he said, yeah, don't, don't, even though al now alcohol is legal, there's still going to be problems with drugs. It's gonna, and he decided to use a, a kind of a well-established tactic subsequently, which is that you, you blame Mexicans for every problem in America. So he changed the name cannabis from cannabis to marijuana claim that Mexicans were crossing the border, getting American men stoned, young men stoned, raping American women because they were you know, taking cannabis. He created a hysteria about cannabis, which has promulgated ever since. And that's, that's, his, that's why it's illegal still in most countries, because the Americans in 1934 persuaded the League of Nations, which they weren't even part of, to, to make cannabis illegal internationally to justify or to support their internal campaign against against marijuana is that what i mean now is it still because it's a shortcut to show a kind of moral probity as a government where you can be doing terrible things but you can then bring up something about drugs and that will get the the, the people that you think are going to vote for you on your side that that, that kind of because it does seem sometimes and we're looking now i mean at one point where you talked about uh, i can't remember but the uh, certain members of government uh, uh, having contempt for evidence and it's a perfect week obviously to have read that sentence in in your book but but that that sense of of this very flimsy morality though which can be you can have such a high horse with it as well yes i mean i think the um it's hard to think of a drug law that isn't largely politically driven. It, 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 the ex drugs are, ex as you pointed out, they're expedients. They're ways of getting, being against drugs and against drug users is a good way of, of you know, raising the flag, call to arms of, the, of, of people that believe both in the law, because of course, a lot of people don't understand that drugs aren't harmful. They think because they're illegal, they must be harmful. So it's a rallying cry, but also, and this is another important point, a lot of people who use drugs don't vote. So you're not losing any votes by attacking drug users and you're gaining votes by uh, allowing the sort of, to some extent, the vindictiveness and, and the sadism of many voters to, to attack something, which there aren't many other things you can attack, really. I mean, homosexuality is legal now, you know, suicide was illegal for a while now. In fact, most of, most of the morally based uh, prohibitions that we had from the, you know, going back to Victorian time, most, they've almost all gone. You know, drugs are really the last vestige of people that want to have a moral um, position uh, in terms of determining on people's behavior. And, and, uh, and that's why this, you know, the newspapers love to come up with scare stories because it fits in with the desire of many people to, to at least know that there is something they can oppose, which uh, <laughs> they won't be you know, vilified for, even though they should be.
Where do you think is the best place for people to go when, you know, when these stories do come? And, and they, they're kind of a seasonal thing, really, aren't they? The, 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 when the, it wouldn't surprise me if one will come up quite soon now, actually. Um, where are the best places for people to go to get the, you know, the correct information, to be able to, to, to start to, to, to spread stuff, which at least is based on, you know, evidence uh, and research? Well, obviously, um, my charity, Drug Science, I mean, when I was sacked as the chair of the ACMD, who set up this charity, Drug Science, so we could explicitly tell the truth about drugs without being sacked again. So, yeah, there's a drug site, sorry, the website, Drug Science website, lots of information about drugs. My podcasts are there talking to people about drugs and, 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 and drug policies, etc. Lots of publications. And, and, of course, you could also read some of my books, which, uh, which also support the charity as well. Yeah, I, I wanted to, in terms of classing drugs, because it was an interesting thing where, you know, for instance, watching cannabis, the way that it, it floated back and forth in between 97 and whatever it was, 2010. And there's something you, you talk about a, a bit being introduced to, um, is it MCDA? This, this way of looking. criteria decision analysis, that's right, yes. And, and so when you're looking at that, so how, looking at different drugs, mm. how does MCDA work? Well, it's a brilliant technology. I didn't know about it until I published a paper in 2007, which came out of the Home Office when I was working with the Home Office, which was, uh, we classified drugs, drug harms into nine separate um, groups. And, uh, and we ranked drugs according to their score on those, not those nine variables. And a guy called Larry Phillips at LSE, who uh, was a professor of decision theory, wrote and said, that's good, David, but you could do better if you use this technique, which I've never heard of. Well, what MCAA does is, is it, MCDA, it basically does two things. The first thing is it, it makes you define exactly what are all the harms. And it turns out there are more than nine harms of drugs. It, it turns out when you do it properly and get it, lots of experts together and looking at the, at the harms of drugs, there are 16 harms. There are nine ways in which drugs can harm people who use them. And there are seven harms to society. So, that, so, and so that's the first thing, determine what the harms are. The second thing is to define all the harms. So you know when you're trying to compare a drug on different arms, you don't actually know what the definition of the harm is. And then the third phase is to take drugs. And we took 20 drugs and you rank them all on each of those 16 variables. So you get, and they're all, they're ranked according to uh, relative um, uh, harm. So the most harmful drug is rated hundred and the least harmful zero and everything's a ratio. And, and because they're ratio scales, you can actually compare things which are, you know, completely different metrics. So you compare a likelihood of dying to the economic cost of you know, being drunk. And then, then finally you do waiting. So you actually decide which of, the, which of these 16 are, are the most important, which are the least important and how, very, how they vary in importance, in importance. And you bung it all into a computer program, it chugs away for a bit. And out, out you come with the data on harms to the user, harms to society, put them together, alcohol is the most harmful. So alcohol, because that's it. Because at one point, I, I think before you used that, alcohol was kind of sitting between class A and class B, wasn't it? Well, that was right. And it turns out alcohol is the most harmful overall in Britain because of the the harm to other people. Alcohol is not the most harmful drug to the user. I mean, you know, in terms of you know likelihood of dying every time you drink, fentanyl or heroin are much more harmful. But because so many people use alcohol, and I would say almost every family in Britain has a member who's either been damaged by their own personal use of alcohol or who's been damaged by someone else's use of, use of alcohol, like a, a drunk driver or something. So it's the massive use of alcohol that makes it overall the most harmful drug. And in terms of illegal drugs, what is it about heroin that makes it so, you know, that uh, so dangerous? Because it stops you breathing. So you die of, you know, respiratory suppression. Intra any intravenous drug use, if there's one message about drug use, don't use it intravenously. That's why, of course, cannabis always scores much lower in harms because you, you can't use cannabis intravenously. Intravenous use kills you because of respiratory depression with some drugs. And also, of course, it introduces viruses and infections to you. So, so but heroin is not the most harmful. Opiate now, fentanyl is more harmful. Fentanyl, it's, it's not killing as many people in Britain as heroin, but in America, it's killing more people. And, and it's very likely that fentanyl will end up being more dangerous and more harmful and more common than heroin in this country. 
And do you think because once something's on the on the list, basically, whether it's class A, class B or class C, everything is it, it means that whatever heroin does, probably cannabis must do it. You know, this seems to be like, for instance, when we look at things like, I, I suppose, overdosing uh, and an addiction that the moment something's called an illegal drug. So, so what do we now know? I do, do these, you know, I suppose separately in terms of, first of all, in terms of addiction. Now I know that, was it with MCDA as well that cannabis came basically the lowest in, in, and that included, you know, cigarettes? The cannabis came out lower than cigarettes, yeah. I mean, when we look at cannabis against alcohol, pretty much on every single measure, cannabis comes out less than alcohol. The only one it came out similarly was the effect of intoxication really. So it, it you know, a society which switched from cannabis, from alcohol to cannabis, would probably be a much less damaged and, and, and less problematic society. And in terms of um, overdosing? Well, we don't know if anyone's ever died of a cannabis overdose. Whereas in Britain, about three young people a week die of alcohol poisoning overdose, accidentally, mostly. So that is, um, again, I, I'm as you say all these things, and I kept finding this in the book, which is once the information is put out there, it seems so hard to work out that even people who would be, you know, in terms of a conservative mindset, small C conservative or large C conservative mindset, um, it still seems that the benefits are so great. I mean, going back to some of the different treatments that you, you are talking about for, for things which are, you know, beyond d debilitating, they are truly paralyzing. Yes, that's right. So, Again, I suppose the question is, where do we get, how do we get those stories out there? Because once you see someone like Alfie, if you saw the, that story and you see that, you know, getting the, the, the medical cannabis, whatever, from, 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 from the Netherlands, you're talking, as you said before, 1,000, 2,000 pounds. These stories, it's, you know, it's always stories that end up cutting through, isn't it? It is. Well, yes, this, and, you know, the story of the child and then also the parents. I mean, it, so how do we change it? Well, there's, it's remarkable um, how people will cling on to the, to the, the most fantastic fears. So I, you know, when, when we, there was a debate in Westminster Hall a few years ago, trying to argue with the then um, drugs minister that we uh, should legalize cannabis as a medicine, not, not just as, a, not, and you, and you would say to him, well, look, you know, opiates are way more dangerous, but they're medicines. <laughs> Cocaine's still a medicine. <laughs> Fentanyl's, yeah. You know, we, you know, everyone accepts there's a value, and we we protect from the harms by having what we call schedules, so that only certain people can prescribe. Why wouldn't you do the same for cannabis? And the answer is, oh, because if we do that, everyone will use it. And you say, well, that's absurd. You know, and you know, you a because they're using it anyway. <laughs> the cannabis market is saturated. It's not there's, the chances of medical cannabis disappearing into recreation use is virtually nil because people don't need it and and even that isn't even the justification because you're you're saying people should suffer and uh, be denied a, a proven treatment simply because you think it might stop other people misbehaving is that is that a, that moral balance is that correct i don't see you applying it to any other drug but so cannabis has always had that weird position in um in, in british life and uh, I mean, the truth is, some people think, you know, um, Robin, think, some people think it started off as racist. It started off because um, Caribbean immigrants were bringing cannabis in, and it was just another way of, of trying to put barriers and trying to, trying to control their behavior back in the 50s. Uh, and it, it got people start, when people start telling lies and, and wanting to tell lies, it's actually quite difficult to dissuade others from doing the same. So in the end, it's, it's we all, we're always still battling with the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the mindset that it's something that's come from somewhere else yeah. and, and that we end up having that kind of, as you said before, I think when we're talking about the FDA and, and the fact that, you know, it was fear and racism that, that got used then and they are, are still very potent things. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, well, I don't, the... Uh, to be honest, if you look in detail at the drug laws, and um, particularly in America, but to some extent in Britain as well, you know, they've been powerful agents of racial oppression. <laughs> you know, people like Billie Holloway killed, basically forced, you know, forced into suicide because they didn't like the fact she was a very good singer. And they didn't like the fact that, you know, they black people in Harlem were, were becoming to the top of the, the media. So they found an excuse 
and they attacked her viciously and viciously um, over her drug use and eventually killed her. I mean, it, 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 it was, it's, it, it, it's, very, it's very difficult to disassemble, you know, the, 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 the racial or the, you know, the minority targeting of drug use from, uh, you know, from, from, you know, what is actually, you know, what, what really should be happening. And of course, this, 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 the opposite side of the coin is that we've done it, we've blind, you know, we've completely blinkered ourselves to the problems of alcohol because we drink, because that's what white people do, because that's what people in number 10 do on a regular basis, even when they're not having parties. You know, I mean, it's, the, the hypocrisy is just pervasive and historic. So is it, are, are we, is it the, uh, you, you mentioned a, a story when, again, trying to change, I think decriminalize uh, uh, cannabis at one point, and uh, when one of the reactions is, but the public will be against this. And you actually showed, a, I think, a, a, a Mori opinion poll, didn't you? Yeah, that was one of the funniest moments. Yeah, so the I mean, the battle lines over the the classification of cannabis has been the biggest set, series of battles in in the whole war on drugs in Britain, certainly in the last fifty years, because cannabis was initially in the nineteen seventy one act. They weren't. I don't think they were really going to control it, but then I believe, and I can't prove this, but I kind of, believe, you know, the evidence is there, sort of, that the Americans forced us to control it. Because the Americans actually had banned it as a medicine in 1934, thinking, absurdly, that if it wasn't a medicine, it wouldn't be used recreationally. And of course, we knew by 1971 that that wasn't the case at all. But Britain, we held out against them. We kept it as a medicine, even though we, it was illegal as a recreational drug. But they pushed us and pushed us and pushed us. Like almost all the drug laws in Britain have been made at the behest of the US. And in 1971, we, they said we, they, we acceded to them and we took cannabis out of the medical pharmacopoeia by an act of parliament. A strange thing to do. I don't think any other drug has been removed from the pharmacopoeia, but it was removed under the Misuse of Drugs Act 71. It was put into class A or class B, depending on the different forms of cannabis. So um, hash and resin were in B and liquid forms of cannabis were in A. And then in about the turn of the century, the House of Lords reviewed medical cannabis, writing a report that was actually remarkable, but it stood, stood the test. You read it today and it, it's just about as accurate as it was then, saying, you know, this is a medicine, it, it, it makes no sense to keep it banned. Let's, let's review it. And so we did, and Blunkett uh, was the first Home Secretary to allow cannabis to be properly reviewed. It was reviewed and we said, look, it should all be class C. It doesn't matter whether it's a liquid or whether it's a, a herbal product or in the class C, because that's where it should be. And the media went bonkers and they attacked us and attacked us and they attacked the Home Secretary. And three times we were sent back to what well, to review the, the status of cannabis. And each time we said no class C. But eventually, you know, the uh, Jackie Smith has said, nope, that's gonna, you know, it's gotta be B. And it, we were forced, it was forced back, even though there was no rationality for that at all. And, uh, but during that, <laughs> that discussion, we thought, well, let's see what the public think. So we did a Mori poll. We asked the public, what do you think? Do you think cannabis should be class A, class B, class C, or legal? And, uh, and so when, when I was meeting with the, uh, the drugs minister, uh, just before they made the announcement about uh, they were they're going to ignore our report, he said, well, we can't do it because the public won't accept it. And I said, go to, go to Appendix 2, because there's a Murray poll, which is the people you use to determine your policies. Look, you'll see in the Murray poll that more people wanted cannabis legal than wanted it Class B and A put together. And he looked at me and he said, that's the wrong kind of public. <laughs> I just burst out laughing. And, you know, I mean, basically what he meant was, you know, they care about the mail and the telegraph. That's the public that they care about. They don't care about the general public. It does seem a huge that, that that constantly it's like the number of you know the regressive voices I was thinking about when uh, in, in terms of things like same sex marriage. And if you'd looked at a lot of the media, you would have believed that the majority of Christians in, in the United Kingdom and the majority of Anglicans, etc., that they were all, you know, up in arms with a few of the extreme liberals not being. And then you actually found out, no, most, most people didn't really care. That's right.
It's, yeah, that out outrage is, is such a fascinating thing. Uh, I, I was just looking somewhere here. I've got a 1910 Pharmacopedia as well, which has got a lot of things which I don't think are readily available in Boots anymore. I, I was just having a quick look, see if I could find it. The um, what, what countries are leading the way now? What, what, and I, I just, you know, in terms of you actually being able to see not only countries leading the way, but the, the, the tangible effects for people in the healthcare systems of those countries? So obviously in terms of number, it's America. Now I think 22 states, no, sorry, it's over 30 states now have medical cannabis. I think 22 states have recreational cannabis. The whole of Canada has recreational and medical cannabis. I think the country that's leading the world in research is Israel. Israel decided that this, this is the future of pharmaceuticals and there's a massive investment. They even have university courses on medical cannabis. Uh, and they're, and they, so they're doing a great deal of work around the utility of cannabis, particularly for elderly people, for helping people who are in homes get stabilized sleep, rate, sleep, wake rhythms for pain, for anxiety and that. So those are, those are, those are probably the three leading countries. And obviously, in terms of historic policy, the Dutch, you know, with their coffee shops separating hard drugs from soft drugs, that was a, that was a brilliant move, which uh, has really shown that you can do that. Their policies like that can actually stop people using heroin because they can get cannabis without going to a, a dealer who's going to offer them heroin as well. It's, it's fascinating. And, and, and what, I mean, what do you think would surprise people most in terms of, we've talked about some of the uh, uh, conditions that cannabis can, can, can treat. Um, I wondered about, you know, what ones that perhaps might be, have been less publicised. Well, the, yeah, so, I mean, there are these rare, these syndromes that, um, that people have discovered themselves. I mean, who, a lot of doctors wouldn't even know what Ehlers-Danlos was, or they, they wouldn't have met a case. And then suddenly these women who's dislocating their hips all the time with their jaws are discovering that they can actually walk without painkillers. So, so these, so syndromes that, like that, connective tissue syndrome, the um, things like uh, Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis. I mean, you know, surprising number of people come up to me and say, you know, look, just to let you know, I've found it's been, you know, it's, it's really dealt so well with my Crohn's disease. But here's an example. Here's an example of prejudice. That was thinking about that. I gave a talk in, oh, where was it, in Croydon a couple of years ago, and a person came up to me afterwards and said, look, I've got Crohn's disease, and I've done really, really well on, on cannabis, but I, you know, I. I have to get it illegally. And, and I said, well, you know, that's unfortunate. Can, you know, what about going to a Crohn's charity? He said, well, I'm, the, I'm on the Crohn's charity. I'm on their national executive. And, and when I said to them, look, why don't we support research on this? They said, oh, we can't do that because it's illegal. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, that in itself is wrong because of course you can, because I've, I've been researching LSD, it's illegal. But the, real, but the point is, the perception is that if you if you do research on something that's illegal, you're endorsing it. You know, well, you know, it's it, that's why that there is a mindset which I think politicians play into, which is if you make something illegal, you don't have to worry about it anymore because no one will ever contest it. You know, people won't ask whether it was right to make it illegal because the mere act of asking will people will look at you and think, well, what are you, some kind of rebel? You know, so so. And I, I, I think it's pro that probably generalizes beyond drugs. I'm very much more concerned about giving anyone a criminal record now because it's very hard. You can't shake it off, basically. Once you've got a criminal record, you've got a criminal record. And people will always assume that, you know, you deserved it somehow. 